What is going on everybody? Jimbo Thick here, proud to present our fifth Q&A session. I will of course be answering the questions you left down in the comment section. Um, personal and mostly lore related. <laughs> of course, I didn't expect less. Um, but this is a chance for you guys to, you know, get to know me a little better as a person, as opposed to just a uh, YouTube entity. And I definitely appreciate all the support I got and all the questions that were asked. That means you guys actually do care <laughs> about uh, more than just lore. So I, I definitely appreciate it, guys. But you didn't hear, you know, you didn't tune in to, to listen to me just ramble on. But I will say this will be a probably rambly video as I mostly don't um, write anything down for this. I just kind of do it off the cuff. So be prepared for that as well if you haven't seen one of these before. And if you haven't seen one of these before, do check the rest of them out. I've got uh, four previous Q&A sessions. Uh, you can find out a little bit more about me. And of course, more lore and um, whatnot. So without further ado, let's get into our first question. Our first question comes from Zach Hauser. And I probably will mispronounce a few people's names. Don't get too offended. Um, he says, my question is, if Malekith is such a badass warrior and mage, and his mom practically invented dark magic, basically making them two of the ultimate badasses, how do they keep getting crushed by the High Elves, especially since he started the War of Vengeance and basically crippled the High Elves forever? You would think the Dark Elves would be at a major advantage. So, the way this happened is you have to look back to how the Dark Elves were founded. So right after the great separation from High Elf society that they had, the Sundering. So what happened was Malekith and essentially all of um, what was formerly Nagarith, which is now Nagarond, was taken from Ulthwan. Now, you have to also put this into perspective. Nagarith is just one province out of the whole island community of Ulthuan. So you're looking at a small percentage of people in comparison to the rest of High Elf society. Now they have had defectors over the years. There's been a few outcast families and whatnot that have defected over to um, the side of Malekith. But for the most part, he started off with very limited numbers. Now, they were very powerful because of the cults of pleasure that he had started in Old One. They got a lot of um, uh, recruits that way from the other provinces besides uh, Nagarith. So all in all, if you're doing the math, they would have been at a severe disadvantage in numbers. They make up for this in zeal <laughs> and of course in the invention of dark magic, which was unheard of at the time and was never properly used and it was uh, very much a taboo and when Marathi started teaching that to people it started getting um, very much out of control so basically you started off with a small population no matter how awesome of a person you are Malekith and Marathi cannot take on the entire nation of Ulthuan on their own it would be impossible just because even if there weren't heroes that have risen up each time that they've tried to invade, there have been heroes that rise up and thwart them in some way because there are people just as capable as them that come out of the High Elves ranks. Um, of course, the most recent is Tyrion and Teclis. Uh, Teclis is probably the greatest mage right now, currently in the current timeline. And this is definitely, if you read the um, Tyrion and Teclis novels, you'll see that there's a massive duel between Teclis and Malekith, and Teclis just shuts him down. Almost kills him in the process. Now, it was a close fight, but um, Malekith being both a very astute wizard and uh, a melee fighter, when he has his magic taken from him, he's just one man, kind of like Tyrion. He's just one man. On the ground, you can only do so much um, in that way. Now, Marathi also, you have to look into the relationship between Malekith and Marathi when you talk about this. Marathi has ulterior motives, and you find that all the way in the 
some of the original books that you read on the Sundering, and then, of course, when you start getting into the Tyrion and Teclis novels, she has her own agenda the entire time. She's working to a plan, a long game plan, that you don't really start seeing the tendrils of it until the end times. And so she's not exactly working for Malekith and his ideal of a unified Ulthwan. She's more working towards survival at any cost, which would be nice if the unified Ulth won, and she sees that they should do that, but at the same time, she has her own agenda, and so they're not on the same page. If they were working together in tandem from the start, things might be different. But, unfortunately for them, they have a limited number of people, even after the War of Vengeance. They still do not have the ranks that the High Elves have. I want to say they are probably close now because the High Elves are starting to die out, essentially. They're they're losing their place. Even on Ulthwan, there's more people in... Um, there are more humans in the town of Lothran now, where is actually the home of Finnebar the Seafarer, the current ranking um, Phoenix King. So... There's more humans in that city than there are elves, and they're starting to let people in, and they're slowly but surely starting to lose their place. They are not a prosperous race, whereas the Dark Elves are starting to actually gain ranks. Now granted, these are elves that have grown up in Nagarond. There's been generations and generations of people that have lived separate from Ulthwan that don't even know what it looks like. They don't know what their homeland is. Nagarond is their homeland. And you get an interesting dichotomy in the way that works and how Malekith is still trying to pursue one aspect of he wants to go back home because he's that old that he remembers what it's like to be there. But um, I'm probably getting very far off topic at this point. But anyways, it would be very difficult for them to do so and it has been in the past. Now, once we get into the end times, we see something a little different, but I won't try to... Um, delve too deep into the end times yet so I'm still I'm still holding out I'm still holding out on the end times but let's uh, hopefully I answered your question um, leave me a comment down in the comment section if you want a little more clarification and I'll try to uh, work on it that way but that's my definitive answer right now is it would be too difficult and for the reasons that I stated I just don't think it would work out and hasn't worked out as seen in the lore previous and my next question, well, kind of question, more or less a statement, is from Oli, I believe is the way it's said. And he asks, slash states, <laughs> since your lore videos are absolutely 10 out of 10, the reason I subscribe to you, among many others, if not most people, why not make more? You're making tons of Let's Play videos, but you are not getting many views on them. Your success in the lore videos... Maybe you could try and talk about lore in your Let's Play videos since you clearly want to make them. Could boost up your views. I appreciate the sentiment, Ollie, but um, I've kind of answered this in a few of my other Q&A sessions. This was originally supposed to be a Let's Play channel, <laughs> so it has become, definitely has become more of a lore channel than anything else, but my passion is for Warhammer, but also for gaming. And my YouTube channel is... I'm not trying to get super famous, guys. I'm not trying to be some YouTube star. I'm not trying to make a, like a, just a buttload of money. It would be awesome if that happened, of course. But at the same time, I'm not actively pursuing that. I, this is not my career choice. Whereas if it was, I would definitely be doing the things that you're saying. Now... Essentially, this channel is a way for me to keep just a little piece, just a little fraction of the man I used to be before I had a family, before I've had responsibilities, before I had a job. And it's just a way for me to basically tell myself, hey, it's okay if you want to play a video game. It's okay if you want to talk about lore, about some fantasy genre that's gone extinct at this point <laughs> and so basically this channel is almost a place for me to still enjoy those things without feeling guilty about not spending time or 
me not wanting to feel like I've wasted my time doing something because time is very precious. And you'll learn that as you get older and as you get more responsibilities and whatnot. Um, just anybody listening to this. It's something I've realized over the years. And uh, yeah, so I do the Let's Plays because I want to play those games. <laughs> and I feel bad if I am playing them and not getting anything out of this. I feel like... Um, Sharing it with you guys and sharing it on the channel is one of those ways that says, hey, you know, it's okay. It's okay for you to do this. You're, you're making, you know, five cents per video. So you, you've done something with your day or something like that. So all in all, it's for me primarily. Um, I do understand what you're saying. And I hope you do enjoy the lore videos. You know, if you just let's play on your thing, I understand that completely. They're not many people's things, in fact. But um, it, it's more for me than for anyone else so i appreciate your concern and i appreciate your advice i really do but um that is my definitive answer on that so <clears throat> with that out of the way let's move on to the next one guys and our next question comes from michael Z i can't pronounce your last name dude zedebel z zedeb Z Z Z oh man z-d-e-b-e-l <laughs> sorry man I can't pronounce it. Um, I'm horrible with that anyway. So it says, he asks, I would love to know if it was possible for High Elf and Dark Elves to switch sides and if that has ever happened in the fantasy genre. So interesting enough, I have kind of already given some examples, but um, the... High Elves and Dark Elves specifically are the same race. It's not like many fantasy genres where, you know, you have like in in a drag, um, what's it called? Dungeons and Dragons. You have you have High Elves and Wood Elves and and um, Drow and they all look different and they're all like almost a different species. In Warhammer Fantasy, all of the elves originally were the same species. Now I do say Originally, because the Wood Elves, at this point, may actually be something else. <laughs> they are different, and that has more to do with the place that they have inhabited um, since the uh, War of the Beard, the War of Vengeance. But back to the High Elves and Dark Elves, a very oftenly used Dark Elf tactic is assassination. And they s slip spies into High Elf society all the time now it doesn't quite go the other way around high elves have a hard time slipping in a spy into dark elf society just because of the sheer brutality and they're just not prepared for something like that they couldn't they couldn't manage it it would be too much it would force them to fall to um to their side if it ever happened so for that reason we actually have had examples of High Elves that have defected to Dark Elf society. It happened during the Sundering, shortly after the Sundering as well. And we actually had a family or two that are mentioned in the War of Vengeance novels that used some um, rather taboo magic that were, after the conclusion of the war, were all but banished and therefore joined the Dark Elves at some point. At least that's what's speculated. Now, as far as a Dark Elf moving over to High Elf Society, we have a single example from the novels. You had a very famous assassin in the Tyrion and Teclis novels um, known as uh, Poison Blade. I don't want to give away too much. I don't want to give away his identity if you ever read the novels because it's uh, it's not a huge twist, but it is. it's one of those that kind of digs. It digs that knife in there. And Poison Blade is seen as a, um, he's been in high society for so long that he's uh, established himself as a rather prestigious individual under his guise. And he learns so much about high elf society that he didn't know before because, like I said, these are generations of people growing up in Nagaron, separate from Ulthuan. They have no idea what the mainland's like, and they're told these things almost like propaganda. 
about how weak the high elves are and how chauvinistic and how all these other things, all these negative things, they're not strong, they're not warriors. And he's proven otherwise. You know, there's many facets to every society. And of course, some of those things are true. But at the same time, it gives him perspective on a lot of the things that are wrong with Nagarond, where he's from, and a lot of things that are wrong with Dark Elf society, which there are a multitude of things you could find wrong with Dark Elf society. And he all but almost defects several times. In the end, um, I don't want to give away too much, but something happens, and as most of you probably know, uh, if you've read the Tyrion and Teclas novels or anything like that, he does end up, in the end, siding with his with Malekith. Now, this may not have been purely out of choice, though. He's all but forced to do it, and I want to say he does actually die. He, he, he actually ends up being killed by Tyrion, and it's a very dramatic conclusion to that. But there are the possibility that this is, since we've given this one example, there's the possibility that this has happened before. Now, it's never actually stated, but if a high quality assassin such as Poison Blade could have defected like this, then it is easily conceivable that um, there have been other defectors over the years that have kind of infiltrated high of society and then decided man, this is not so bad, and not want to go back to Nagarond. And you could understand that from their perspective. So there is that, that single example, um, but those are my opinions on uh, the possibility of other elves swapping sides. And our next question goes to Frog Vapor, who asks, what is your favorite Total War Warhammer 2 race, and what is your least? So, a uh, good old classic Total War question. I, uh, I definitely love uh, Total War Warhammer big time. Second one is better than the first, and I'm looking forward to the third one very much. But as far as races are concerned, if we're only doing Total War Warhammer 2 races, so that, that does peel the onion back a little bit. Um, my favorite Total War Warhammer 2 race, it's, I mean, it's got to be hands down. My favorite, like my favorite one to play, is the Skaven. I just, I love the Skaven. Well, I, the thing is, I love artillery, and they have some of the best <laughs> by far. And they also just have a lot of interesting units. And I feel like their roster is just not there yet. Um, that's what's kind of holding them back. They're missing a lot of the more thematic units that I think that they'll be getting, and they, uh, whenever the next DLC for them is released hopefully soon <laughs> it's been a while since they've released a uh, substantial DLC um, I guess the Vampire Coast counts it was a whole new faction but it was just honestly just borrowing mechanics from all the other factions so it wasn't that big in my opinion um, but I want I want a big update for the Skaven that's what I want I want new units I want a, a new Lord I want all the good stuff but uh, yeah, they're definitely my favorite. Um, but I want to be able to make more thematic armies with them. I want to be able to be like, hey, this is a Clan Molder army. This is a Clan Eshin army. Um, themed army. Uh, so on and so forth. Um, just because that's kind of how I like to play Total War anyway. <laughs> it's very themed. <laughs> so, as far as my least favorite, um, out of the ones in Warhammer 2, my least favorite to play is probably the high elves for being honest they're just kind of i've never really been a big high elf fan anyway i they have excellent lore um they have very in-depth very long very intricate lore and it, they have some of the more interesting stories told but um it, as far as total war is concerned they're kind of just a it's kind of a bland army, you know? Almost like the Empire, kind of, we do just about everything, <laughs> you know? But, except for artillery. Now, um, I do think the High Elf army is also very overpowered, especially when it comes to late game. Oh my gosh, if you're playing campaign, late game is just dragons, dragons, dragons. And I wish, <laughs> I wish that they would... 
install some kind of lore appropriate um, governors on a lot of the Total War armies in general. This is just my personal opinion. I oh, mean, I wish there was a mod for this, to be honest with you. But dragons are rare. I mean, they're super rare. For you to have more than a handful of dragons in any army would be insanity in, uh, in the modern setting, which Total War is supposed to be in the modern setting. So it's just crazy that you could just feel like, especially the, the AI, towards end game, it's just like, oh, there's, I don't know, 15 dragons <laughs> coming to fight you. And it just, it shouldn't be like that. They should have caps. Similar, you know who does it well is the Tomb Kings. Um, the cap system that they have in place. I really like that. Uh, though they're not my favorite faction. Um, they still have a very good faction. I like the way that they have that cap system in place. I feel like they should probably do that for some of the other races. Especially the ones that make sense with the ridiculous creatures that they can field. So, that's my two cents on that. <laughs> so let's move on to the next question. So on to our next question, which is a, a very good one, actually, from Inquisitor Thomas. Question about the Tomb Kings. How come Cetra is such a domineering presence in the Hekara, militarily speaking? Shouldn't the younger Tomb Kings have access to better equipment and magic, as well as more constructs that were developed after Cetra's death? Now, this is the interesting part about um, Nehekara and the way all of that is uh, concerned. Cetra is the only Tomb King, actual king, that can use magic, if that makes any sense. In the lore, he's the only one that learned the magic of the mortuary cult, the priests. Now, he's not a super magician, but um, he's the only one that can uh, actually utilize any of the spells, you would call them, the rites of uh, the god of the underworld. So, that in and of itself elevates him to a higher status. And then there's the simple fact that um, when Cetra was buried, he was buried with such a massive amount of troops and um, war engines. And here's the other thing about Tomb Kings. They're very traditional, um, emulating those before them. And so, while there were some more advanced constructs, for the most part, they kind of stuck to the same ideal constructs, if that makes any sense, from uh, from Cetra's time going forward. Now, at a certain point, you also have to realize that the constructs themselves are actually just reimaginings of their gods and whatnot that didn't exist before they all died. <laughs> I know they, they, it gets a little weird. But there actually weren't, for instance, Ushapti. Ushapti did not exist in their current form as they did before um, Nehekara was turned into the land of the dead. Ushapti were actually living, breathing, um, gifted people from their gods. The constructs that we get now are just imitations of what existed before. And so a lot of the constructs actually don't even um, affect the initial power struggle that went into effect uh, whenever all of the Land of the Dead awoke at the same time. And Cetra just won out of sheer amount of volume, essentially. He had such a ridiculous volume of troops, well-armed and armored troops, that he over overthrew all the other rival Tomb Kings. And he's been systematically oppressing them. He hasn't been allowing them to do anything. He hasn't been allowing them to band together to try to overthrow them. Because now that they all realize what they are and what's going on, it would be pretty easy if all of them were awake simultaneously to overthrow Cetra and then carve Nehekara up into its individual kingdoms. But as it is right now, Cetra was a brilliant tactician in life and even more so in death. And so, the Imperishable One has sat upon his throne and will continue to do so of course, until the end times. But <laughs> that is that. Hopefully I answered your question for you. And let's move on to the next one. Our next question comes from Sir Donald Le Savage. <laughs> Donald Sir, Sir Dodinas Le Savage. I probably said it wrong. 
I'm sorry, but cool name regardless. Um, I'm glad to see you're doing well. Uh, he's got a question regarding the Warhammer Fantasy um, RPG game that I'm running currently. It says that you can hear dice rolling in the background. Are you guys playing it all together at the same table, or are you guys separated via the net? If the latter, is there any chance you should program a kind to roll 20 so that the audience can see all the rolls and receive a better understanding as to whatever is going on? So, we are all in our individual homes. So we're doing this all online. Unfortunately, my players is going to be the biggest issue I have with this. Um, we live in Arkansas. <laughs> some of us in some small towns and we don't have access to really high speed, high quality internet. So we are actually um, in a party chat on PlayStation Messenger <laughs> or through our PS4s is what we're, we're utilizing. And it's all done um, on the honor system. Um, I'm not fudging my roles or anything like that. And I'm pretty sure they're not either because we've had some, some pretty terrible roles. The guys that I'm playing with, I've known for a while, and they're, they're pretty honest, honest guys. So they're not going to try to do anything like that. But it's all online, and the chances, especially of one of our members um, getting him to purchase a PC and or utilize any other program, would be uh, more trouble than it's worth. <laughs> so we'll be staying as we are now. I am looking into trying to find some Dane background music for you guys. Um, I won't be able to play it for them while we're playing, but for you guys. And it, that has been, it has been a problem because of all the rules and standards of using music and all of this other stuff that YouTube has. So I'm trying to figure out a workaround around that and something that's not going to annoy you guys. I don't want to keep replaying a 30 second clip over and over again for, you know, a half hour because that'll get old too. But um, regardless, I am working on trying to trying to help that out a little bit. So hopefully I answered your question. And um, thanks for watching. I definitely appreciate anybody paying attention to the, uh, the RPG I've been running. I've been having a lot of fun with it. And on to our next question from MadWookie98. I've seen you in the comment section before, sir. Thanks for uh, supporting me <laughs> for as long as you have. Um, I've noted when playing Total War Warhammer, there are multiple Vols Anvils locations. Follow the elven god of smithing and crafting. Is there a lore explanation for this, or is it just for the gameplay? So, um, in the lore, uh, Vols, there are actually three Vols Anvils. In um, Total War, I believe you get access to two of them on the big map. And you can get access to the third if you have the original Total War and you play the um, Wood Elves DLC in their mini campaign. So there is a Vols Anvil for each race uh, or each category of elf, essentially. There's one in Kalidor, there's one in um, Nagarond, and there's also one in Athaloran, the home of the Wood Elves. And essentially, what this breaks down to is, I would, if I had to guess, if I had to say, hey, this is the original, probably the one off of, in Kalidor was probably the original, if we're being honest. Um, it's the one on Ulth One, and supposedly it's the place where Val actually made his weaponry, made all, he actually smithed the weapons, especially the ones he gave to Kane uh, during their infamous uh, feud that they had and whatnot. And it's a sacred place and a place of worship for the followers of Vol, the cult of Vol, essentially, in um, High Elf uh, religion. Likewise, there's also a Temple of Vol in Nagarond with the Dark Elves. Basically, the Vol's Anvil mon moniker is placed on any of the temples associated, the major temples associated with the Elven God Vol. So there actually is lore on that. It's not just them um, kind of getting lazy and just kind of putting it in there. And in fact, in the end times, actually, I don't, we, we're not getting in the end times, not getting into it, but, um, you, the one, the Vol's Anvil and Alpha Lauren comes into play more. Um, at least somebody that may or may not be part of, I, I don't want to give too much away if you guys haven't read it before. <laughs> so 
So yes, the, the one in Alpha Lauren comes into play quite a bit as well. On to the next question. Um, just Mike. That's just your name, just Mike. <laughs> Why not get in touch with Arch Warhammer? Your lore vids are top tier, and he does, like, streams with other YouTubers. So, um... I have attempted to partner with a few different YouTubers in the past. Arch is on a different level than me, as far as subscriber base. I'm, like, way down at the bottom, and he's he's got, like... <laughs> Well over a hundred thousand followers. Um, he's he's up here. I'm a, I'm down here. He's doing this full time almost. He could probably easily do this as a profession. I'm like this is my hobby kind of person. So I'd be you know if Arch wanted to talk to me that would be awesome. But at the same time I do remember actually sending something to him like hey you want to do something together? I know I'm just a little peon and he never responded and I don't blame him because even back then I almost had no followers. But, uh, yeah, I'd be interested in partnering with other YouTubers if they wanted to do something as far as um, in the lore, lore community-wise, uh, talks and things like that. I wouldn't have a problem doing that, but nowadays, especially with my schedule the way it is now, it would be difficult for me to even arrange time to do anything like that. So, it's a bit of give and take. Um, back when I first started doing YouTube, it would have been more plausible, but now... I would have to make time, and um, any time I make comes comes out of sharing that time with uh, my other responsibilities I have as a functional human being in society. So there is that. But I, I appreciate the comment, sir, Mr. Mike. So our next question comes from Petrucci Abiza. You have also been a longtime fan, sir. I appreciate you. Uh, so, and you've always uh, given me good questions, so I appreciate that. Definitely in the Q&As. So, Mr. Ibi Ibiza? 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 I'm probably not saying it right. You know who you are. <laughs> so, anyways, um, you've got a couple a couple questions. That's okay, though. First thing, how is my family? I uh, hope I'm doing all right. Man, I appreciate that. And, yeah, the family is doing good. Everybody's healthy. Um, my wife is steadily working. And I'm working full-time. We're both working full-time. I've got a one-year-old now, one-year-old girl. And, um, yeah, it is, it's crazy. I'm not going to lie. Uh, there's a lot, <laughs> especially with the nature of my profession. Um, and then my wife's profession. My wife works in the hospital. She has strange hours. I'm a professional firefighter. So I also have strange hours. I work a 24-hour shift. And then I'm off for two days, but it's it get, it gets complicated regardless. So yeah, we're we're doing good, and I uh, I appreciate the thoughts. Um, second, you would you would like to know more about some obscure Warhammer lore, Dragon Isles, um, the islands, but below Nippon. Oh lord, <laughs> no one ever talked about these parts of the worlds, and they are one of the biggest mysteries for me left in Warhammer. And yes, they will forever be mysteries to you, sir, because there is almost nothing written on them. I mean, it is it is bare minimum. Uh, some of the only mentions of, especially in Nippon, is just passing phrases about the um, from the Skaven, <laughs> essentially, which they don't document their history, so it's purposely ambiguous. And then you get a little bit when you look into some of the Dark Elf stuff where they used to raid and take them as slaves and still probably do. Um, there's not much uh, on the smaller islands and uh, things like that of Nippon and Ind specifically. There's almost nothing. Cathay, you get a little bit more because of the, the ogres' kingdoms are, are somewhat close by, so you get a little bit of interaction with them. And uh, you, you get a little bit more on Cathay. They also have ties to the uh, Nehekara. If you read some of the fantasy novels, there's ties to Cathay. And you get to see a little bit of their culture, which is, is interesting um, that they did that. But sorry, sir, there is not much to go on. Maybe one day I will try to dig up what I can. And there is almost nothing. But I will dig up what I can. And maybe even look into some of the fan-made stuff. And... Um, try to cobble together something uh, realistic I don't want to give anything away for my players hopefully they won't watch this but 
I am currently working on some research into Nippon specifically in reference to my Warhammer Fantasy roleplay. So if you're watching my roleplay, you might get to see a little glimpse of Nippon in some way. It won't be necessarily be completely canon because, like I said, there's almost nothing. But it is close to what I've been able to discern. So keep that in mind. <laughs> Um, oh, and you had one more question. Now that I'm at 5,000 subs, how much do I earn from YouTube in a month? It is, oof. So if you wanted to, essentially you're asking this uh, to see if you could do it full time. If you want to do this full time, you need to have a lot of subscribers. And right now it's actually based off of views. It's based off of views and how popular your, vid your video is. Likes uh, come into a... Uh, a big preference uh, and even dislikes even likes and dislikes and uh, just views in general view time specifically somebody if somebody watches your video for a minute and then clicks off that's not good so there's a view time aspect to it how many commercials can you run blah 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 there's this huge ridiculous amount of uh, like factors that come into play but I make almost nothing for the amount of time I put into YouTube, for me it's a hobby. And if you were doing this full time, you would need to really hammer home, and you need a ton of subscribers to actually make a a decent living off of YouTube. I might make no, I, not even that. It's not even worth saying how much I made in a single month. It's 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 nothing <laughs> compared to the amount of hours I put into it. So, yeah. Just know that you need a lot of uh, support and you're going to need a great deal of time. And it just, if you're trying to build yourself specifically to be a professional YouTuber, there are some other videos I'd probably recommend watching first. Um, some more people that are more knowledgeable on that. But as far as my experience thus far, it's not an, a, uh, an easy field to... Um, delve your, yourself into without a certain niche of some kind so keep that in mind if that's what you're trying to do mr abiza but i wouldn't recommend i wouldn't recommend quitting your job and starting a youtube channel and thinking you're gonna do awesome so uh definitely take time kind of dip your toe in it see if you like it and then go from there so hopefully i answered your question if you got if you want uh more explanation leave me a comment down in the comment section for this video and i'll try to you know, I'll try to flush out some more of what, I, what I'm kind of talking about. So, on to our next question from Frog Vapor. <laughs> Why is Grom the Ponch the best character in Total War? Oh, sir. Grom the Ponch. Did I, did I mention that I hate the Greenskins? I, de I deplore the Greenskins. I don't hate them. They're probably, they might be my least favorite war, uh, Warhammer faction, though, if I'm being honest. Not from a total war perspective, but from a um, lore perspective. They are... Well, they, they're put in as a joke. They're, they're just one big joke. That's tons of poop jokes and penises and... I mean Just crazy, ridiculous things that happen and... Uh, yeah goblins and orcs and all of them are just one big flat out joke is what they are they are the fodder <laughs> for most armies um i don't care for green skins but grom the paunch is a interesting green skin i'll at least give you that a lot of the uh green skins are just kind of throwaway characters in my opinion even some of their more legendary characters are like oh okay so he's just a big orc um oh he's a sneaky goblin you know that kind of stuff but Grom the Paunch is interesting, for those of you that don't know. He actually is a goblin who is huge at this point because he ate a uh, uncooked troll that was not completely um, dead. And it started to regenerate in his stomach. Um, they had a name for <laughs> what the disease that they called it. Um, I can't remember it right now off the top of my head. But um, you should definitely look in the ground with the punch. He's funny. Um, all the green skins are funny. But um, so he got super big. He's like huge. And he led a, a wah through the empire. And um, I want to say right now he is currently 
on Othwan? Or did he made it to Othwan? I don't remember exactly. I'm not an expert on all things green skin. As much as, you know, I wish I could say I was an expert on everything in Warhammer. But I would have to recollect on that. I want to say that um, if you want to know more about Grom especially, there is a good YouTube video done by... Um, who, who did that video? I want to say it was the NF General. He's got a good video on Grom the Paunch if you're looking for more information on Grom. I don't know if I'll ever get around to him. Probably not, unless he's unless he's added as a legendary lord one day. Then maybe, maybe. But regardless, he's not that great. He is great. He's not that great to me. So those are my personal opinions on that. Feel free to blast me in the comment section on that, though. And our next question is from Andre Krivov. Krivov. I don't know what it's called. I'm sorry. So, I'm sorry I messed your last name up. Hey, Mr. Thick, I was just wondering, how old are you? And also, where are you from? Thank you. You're a grateful fan from New Zealand, all the way from New Zealand? Man, I appreciate you, man. I appreciate you. I'm sorry I butchered your name. It's gonna happen, though. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, how old am I? I am currently turning 31. So, uh, I'm getting... I'm definitely... I feel older, for sure. But I'm, I'm not that old. Um... I am from originally from um, Las Vegas, Nevada. Everybody knows that place. And when I was young, we moved to Arkansas. Yes, the middle of the woods. I went from the desert to a highly wooded area. It was uh, a big change, to say the least. So, and I've been here for at this point, I've been here for the majority of my life here in Arkansas now. So. That is where I'm originally from, and um, yeah, thank you, thank you very much for the, uh, for you know, not many people ask about my personal life, so I, I appreciate those questions whenever I get them. Um, yeah, <laughs> thank you, sir. Hope you have a good day, Mr. Uh, Andre. I'll use your first name because I'm pretty sure I'm saying that right at least. On to our next question, which is from Inquisitor Thomas. Once again, <laughs> why would a wood elf and a dwarf work alone inside each other in Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay? Considering how much dwarves hate elves and how isolationist wood elves tend to be. So as far as the Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, um, the idea that they've kind of put in the uh, actual rule book and all of that is that you should make it work with whatever you can, even if you have to twist the lore a little bit to make it work. Now, from a strict lore perspective, on the surface, these would be, there's no way in hell a dwarf would ever work with an elf. They've gone so far as to not sell to elves, <laughs> regardless of, you know, their love for money. They will use a intermediary, a human, to uh, exchange their goods for them with the elves. They know they're selling to the elves, but in a way it's not besmirching their honor, uh, so on and so forth. Regardless, uh, wood elves. Now, this this pairing in particular um, could be an easy fix, because in the lore we do get examples of wood elves, specifically towards the tail end of Warhammer Fantasy and into the end times, actually kind of branching out, realizing that their isolationist behaviors aren't going to cut it anymore. There's too many threats to the world at large, and they need these other orderly kingdoms to stand to protect them. Because if they fall, eventually Athalorn will fall. And so, for this reason, they start branching out. They start helping Bretonia. They help people in the Empire using the world routes to travel great distances, pop out of the woods, help somebody, and then quickly retreat and go back to where they came from. Now, as far as a um, fantasy roleplay um, campaign goes, as long as the campaign involves some kind of greater threat at large that might affect um, the fall of a province or the threat of the nearby woods. Um, something that might even be so far off that the average person wouldn't understand why this is such a big threat. Or it could be a burgeoning threat. For instance, they could be hunting a particular beastman who, through prophecy, 
who <laughs> the one the um, leader of the Wood Elves often delves into fate and essentially uh, prophecy. Maybe this particular beastman was seen to be a great war leader and one day will lead a herd into Athel Lauren. Therefore, you send out a small team of wood elves or even a single wood elf to nip it in the bud before he gets to be the big war leader he used to be. Um, you could make that work and in that instance, a partnership with anyone would be um, acceptable as far as the wood elves are concerned. They are a little bit easier than it than you would initially think, even though they do tend to be standoffish, especially if you approach them in their homeland. But there are examples of them helping others, specifically Bretonia. They do a lot of helping with Bretonia. Now, working with a dwarf would seem a little, uh, a little, a little iffy, um, especially from the dwarf standpoint. But for instance, if it was a slayer, slayers tend to not have the same uh, values <laughs> that many dwarves have. They still do. They're still dwarves. They still have like core, unmovable, unshakable things, but a lot of the hang-ups that they might have had as a regular dwarf tend to not exist anymore. Um, there's examples in the Gotrek and Felix series of a certain dwarf that uh, claims to have had relations with some elven twins at one point and all, all kinds of things. So um, he could have been just blowing it out of his ass, but he could also have been talking truth. There's no way to know. So we at least know that uh, slayers do that. And you would think that some dwarves uh, maybe would be standoffish, but wouldn't deny help outright, especially if this isn't affecting like a Karak or, you know, or they're not like in a dwarven hold accepting help because then that would sure as hell would never happen. But um, you get the idea. You could just kind of work around it if you're trying to make it very lore appropriate. There are examples of it in the lore and you, you could make it work, especially if there's a, a bigger threat or a burgeoning threat. So that would be one way to do it. And that would be the way I would do it if I had um, those kinds of players in my party and I was the GM. So hopefully that answered your question. And our last question comes from Vincent Legas Legas Legasi Legas. Damn it! Everybody's got a weird name. Well, it's not weird. I just can't pronounce anything. <laughs> so yeah. Oh, silly American, silly American. And he asks, well, more so, just states with an exclamation point. I'd really love to see some. Tilia or Talea lore and army expectations for Total War Warhammer 2. Man, um, so in my personal opinion, we are not going to see uh, Talea, unfortunately, <laughs> or Estalia. They're there. It won't be until Games Workshop gets desperate to fill them in that we'll actually get to see them. Um, that's just my, that's what I think. Uh, I think we would be more likely to see Araby than we would be to see Talea and Astalia. First off, because they're not that much different. Uh, as far as the lore concerned, they're not that much different from any of the other human factions that we already have. Now, the Border Princes would be an interesting one, but they only have settlements in the larger map, in the uh, Grand Campaign map, not in the vortex map so that would be a hard one to put in there unless they just made the roster for uh for the border princes uh the roster for talea and for astalia which i could see them doing that as well but it's mostly run by mercenaries so i could see that happening as far as uh, speculation now if they were going to do it right there's a lot of cool stuff they could do. Uh, mostly borrowing from the mercenaries that you get from the army books. The supple, supplemental army books, that is. And, uh, yeah. Other than that, though, there, there, there's not a whole lot of concrete lore on their fighting preferences. Outside of they mostly just use mercenary armies to defend themselves. Uh, very uh, <laughs> interesting. 
Um, of course, the Taleans are supposed to be, you know, Italian. And then the Estalians are supposed to be like Spain, like the Spanish. So they have those kind of influences about them. And uh, they're, it, they're interesting factions in the lore. There's not a ton said about them because they never had their own official army books. There are fan-made army books that you could find if you're more interested in that. But of course, that's not considered canon. And as far as canon is concerned, there's not a whole lot on them. Uh, probably more so than like Cathay and Nippon, but uh, still not, not a ton. So, sorry about that, man. But yeah, that's as far as my speculation goes as far as uh, those two factions in particular. Now, Araby, though, would be an interesting one, very interesting one, and I could see them maybe doing it. Um, they are in the Vortex map. There is plenty of spots for Araby, and they would be a good counter to the Tomb Kings because you'd have some living, breathing people like you're supposed to <laughs> in the uh, right above the Land of the Dead, and they would just have an interesting set of units if they ever brought them in. They also are a faction that never had a real... Um, concrete army book but in the lore and then and um, I can't remember the name of the other book that was made it wasn't done by Games Workshop it was done by somebody else a war master a war, war something I can't remember the name of it but they had a roster for the Araby faction and I for the life of me, I can't remember it right now, but it does exist. It's just not official from Game Workshop. And they had like gins and wind spirits and camel infantry, all kinds of cool things that would be cool to see. Be very thematic and it would set them apart from the other races of men. So it would be an interesting faction for sure. And I would look forward to seeing them. I feel like they are more likely than a lot of the other races. The only other race that I might, I might, uh, well, I, I hope uh, gets added one day would be like an Albion centered um, faction. Oh my gosh, that would be a dream come true for me. I love the idea of Albion and it's almost like medieval, uh, or not medieval, <laughs> it's almost like, uh, what would you call that? It's supposed to be the UK, it's what it's supposed to be like ancient version of UK, you know, when they were like doing Stonehenge and all that kind of stuff. You got the painting, the, the blue paint. Uh, at, anyways, I'm getting a little off topic, but I would love to see them. That would be fantastic. And I feel like they would have a very diverse and interesting roster for sure. But um, yeah, I probably just need to do a whole video on uh, expectations, probably for Warhammer 3, because Warhammer 2, honestly, boys, is starting to come to the end of its lifespan um i give it maybe six months maybe maybe one more year if they really stretch it for them to um add some more factions if they're going to and then they're going to start cranking out warhammer 3 and they have i'm hoping learned their lesson from 2 and will make it compatible and not have to wait all this time for the mega campaign map that they've been talking about <laughs> this whole time so we'll see what we see and with that we are wrapping up this q and a session boys thank you so much for your question guys um this is the celebrate you know 4700 followers almost the 5000 i didn't know how long it would be to 5000 so i decided to do 47 <laughs> so <clears throat> man i i never expected to get this big and I just really appreciate all you guys and all the support I've gotten over the years to keep the channel going and, you know, keep the lore running, all that good stuff. So, ah, man, I definitely appreciate it. I hope you guys got something out of the Q&A session. Hopefully you learned something new. Hopefully I um, adequately answered your questions. If not, you know, feel free to leave them in the comment section again and we'll see what we can do. But uh, as usual, guys, I've been Jumbo Thick. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much for supporting me. And I look forward to seeing you guys in some of my other videos. Have a good day.